I thank Professor Gupta for inviting me to provide a lecture on composites materials for AME 546, and we'll be discussing a number of topics here. here. And my name is uh, Vinay Goyal. I have a bachelor's degree in the mechanical engineering from the University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez. I have a PhD in aerospace and ocean engineering from Virginia Tech, and I have an extensive background in structural systems, uh, including aerospace structures, composites, bolted joints, bonded joints, dynamics, and fader modes. And the fader modes I've uh, been involved in are fader modes related to composites, fracture mechanics, fatigue, buckling, and so forth. I have extensive experience in the area of systems engineering, reusable launch vehicles, and spacecraft applications. What is the motivation? The motivation is that advanced composite materials are extensively used in high performance applications. And so they can be used in automotive to decrease weight in aircraft and ship uh, systems, and in, including launch vehicles and also spacecraft. And the reason we use composite structures is because by decreasing the weight of the systems, we're then able to increase the efficiency and performance of these systems. So I can use less fuel if an aircraft uses composite materials as an example. So composite applications, they're used in extensive number of applications, including a turbine blade that you see here. Uh, and they typically fail in fatigue in these applications. Composites are also used extensively in aircraft design. And the 787 body, which is made by using a lot of composites, over 50%, in the main fuselage body, the metallic gray, with a combination of aluminum, which is the red, 20%, titanium, which is orange, to some percentage, which is fairly low, and then steel at 10%, which is blue and shown here, and then other materials. The composites really have increased the performance of a lot of systems. And this is very, very good, and that's why it's being used. But they have also significant amount of downsides. They have upsides and downsides. By comparison, if I were to compare this aircraft to a 777, a 777 used 12% composites and 50% aluminum. So the 787 is a much more advanced system, is more robust, but also provides higher performance compared to heritage systems. So what are composite materials? And the composite materials is really the combination of two or more materials. And the types of materials we'll be discussing here is a matrix. You're gonna have a matrix material with a fiber impregnated within the matrix. The matrix material tends to be such that's malleable. So before you cure it, it's malleable. And that material, that matrix material, is soft at the beginning, it holds the fiber and binds the fiber together. That's the whole point of the matrix, is to keep everything together. I'll look at it similar to, say, a shirt. You can see the fibers running through your shirt in perpendicular directions. Uh, but think of that shirt now bath on a glue some, of some sort, a, a resin glue of some sort. So that's what we're talking about. That resin material, when it, when it hardens, now is going to have the fibers impregnated in that material, running perpendicular to each other. And so now when that glue hardens, now you're going to have a composite material that's quite strong because the material, material now is going to have those fibers going through. If you heard of wood structures, woods, the wood structure is basically composite materials because you have these fibers going through the uh, trunk of that tree or the wood, and that fiber is pro really providing that strength. Another application of composites that you may have heard is reinforced concrete. Concrete, you can have concrete with steel bars going through them. Well, there the steel becomes your fiber and the concrete is your matrix. Matrix is is going to be the one that holds those steel bars together. And the matrix in that case is providing the load transfer from fiber to fiber. If that matrix was not there, then each fiber acts independently. 
The matrix usually is ductile, it's a tough material, and is low density. And the strength usually is way lower than fiber, similar to a reinforced concrete. The concrete is very low strength, but the fibers are high strength. The, 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 reinforced, uh, the reinforcement in that scenario. The matrix also serves a very important aspect. Uh, the aspect there is that the matrix provides shape, shape to the structure. And that's extremely important in what is done. Because if I have a curved structure, just by me having fibers, that's not gonna cut it. I need to have shape to that structure. And to give it shape, the matrix can help me with that. Fiber is a reinforced material. It's a reinforcing material. And it's also known as a filler. It carries about 75% to 90% of the load, while the matrix carries a much lower percentage. I'll explain later why that is. The fiber provides structural properties to the composite, such as stiffness and strength, and it provides thermal stability and electrical conductivity or insulation. It can actually be very good at that. So in reality, at the end of the day, bottom line is we're gonna study materials where the fiber is embedded within the matrix. And here I have a pictorial of that. Here you can see the matrix material clearly it's not gonna look like this exactly. In, in reality, you're gonna have a fiber bundle or total of fibers uh, in the 12K range, 12,000 fibers bundled in a toe. And, and, and so that's gonna be embedded in the matrix. You're gonna have a lot of these fibers running along the length of that composite. And I'll teach you about the types of composites we can have later. You have the lamina, so at the lamina level, this is going to look like this. You're gonna have a laminated composite. A lamina, single lamina is gonna look like this with fibers running along one direction. That's one potential option. You can have other options where the fibers run perpendicular in two directions and they're perpendicular to each other. You have composites where the fibers run in three directions. We call those tractionally braided composites. I'll be teaching that a little bit later on. But the kinds of composites we're talking about are laminated composites, where I take multiple laminas, and you can see here, this lamina here is running at a particular angle. This lamina here is running at a different angle. Each lamina could be tailored to give you the optimal performance for the actual application. So when you use that in the actual structure, you're getting the best performance you can. And this whole, that's the whole point of composites. If I were to use aluminum, and everything, every direction had the same property, then obviously I have less knobs to turn in order to optimize the structure. For aluminum, if I were to give in a material like aluminum, the only thing I can really do is modify the thickness. And maybe I can change the material, but I don't have a lot of options, right? Just one option there. So, Again, what I'm trying to say here is that with composite materials, I can change the ply angles. So these angles can be changed. These ply angles can be changed. I can change the fiber system. I can change the resin system. So I have, I can even change the thickness to some level. I can actually tell you how many plies I want even. Not only can change the angle and the number of plies, I have knobs I can turn. I can change the angles. I can change the thickness. I can change the material, the resin. I can change the material of the fibers. With If I have a metallic structure or metallic part, I cannot change the ply angles because I'll get the same properties. Doesn't matter which, which angle I put the metal in, I'm gonna get basically the same behavior. So that's, that's what we're trying to say with knobs to turn. I have more possibilities with composites than I do with metal. I have more options. Now with additive manufacturing, there's now the ability to do more even, but that doesn't mean that we have even that number of knob to turns because now with composites, now there's also 3D printing as well, okay? So that, that's what we're talking about here. Okay, so there are a lot of different types of composites. So you can have a particulate composite, 
Concrete to me is perfectly compatible because if you put stones, rocks, and sand, and the binding material, that, that's basically a particularly composite. Uh, but we're not going to cover this kind of composites. Uh, you could have a situation where you have fibers running randomly within, within a block. We call that fiber reinforced composite. Um, we're also not talking about this one. You could have flake composite where the fibers are chopped and maybe they have a very non-uniform fiber distribution across the composite. We're not covering that either. Now you can apply the ideas of this class to these types of composites, very easy to do, very easy to do. Uh, but the kinds of composites we'll be covering in this course is laminated composites, which are gonna look like this. It's gonna look orderly. The fibers are continuous uh, and uh, they're laminated. So I can stack the, lam the composites like this. And this is what is used for 99% of, of the applications. You could have these other ones, but the ideas I'm teaching in this course can still apply to these other ones. It's just not gonna specialize what we teach to this class of composites, okay? So that's, that's what we're talking about here. We're not saying we're not gonna cover the other kinds of composites, but that we're emphasizing the idea of composite materials in light of laminated composites. That's what we're talking about. I'm going to go ahead and share a, a video of composites.
And the manufacturer composite can, can be such that a lot of different defects could occur. And that includes porosity, defects between plies, identations from the pressure sensor, uh, and all, many other things that we'll be covering later. And the point that I was, the reason I was showing that slide, those videos, is so you can get familiar with how the composite looks like. You're not able to touch it, but you can see the texture from afar in that video. And you can see kind of like the very top level view on how it's made. And so, so what I, what I, why we need to learn composite is because composites can be tailored <coughs> to get the most out of a design. That's really the bottom line. Now, if you use composites um, and you use uh, the standard set of angles, say you use zero plus minus 45, 90, symmetric. And what I, when I say zero plus minus 45, 90, symmetric, what I mean is that the laminate, the fibers are running along the zero degree direction relative to some global direction that you define. The 45 degree, the laminate, the, the lamina that follows us on top is going to be at a 45 degree orientation. And then the minus 45 is going to be in the minus 45 degree orientation relative to the global coordinate system. And then finally, I'm going to add a 90, 90 degree ply on top, which will be perpendicular to the very first one you put, which was zero degree ply. So the 90 degree orientation means that the plies are running, the fibers are running along the 90 degree orientation relative to the global fixed direction that we define. And I said symmetric because the ply that follows will be 90, minus 45, 40, and zero degrees. So you'll have eight ply. That ply stacking sequence I just talked about is a very commonly, commonly used stack, stack, uh, ply stacking sequence. And that ply stacking sequence may not be the best for every design. So just because you use composite and it sounds cool and you tap into the zero plus minus 45, 90 symmetric, doesn't mean that you got the best out of the composite. Because if you have more loading condition in, the, in, the, in a particular direction, I want more fibers oriented along the loading direction that's primarily, uh, say, at zero degrees. So if, it's, if the loading condition is primarily at zero degrees, I want to have as many plies as I can along that direction because I want the fibers to take the load. So it's very important to understand that to tailor composites, I just don't go to the standard zero plus minus 45, 90, which I see in a lot of designs. I see a lot of designs just go to the zero plus minus 45, 90, symmetric, but you're not gaining a lot by using that ply stacking sequence. Uh, it could be correct for some applications, but it may not be the best for if you, the loading conditions differ from direction to direction from one to direction to another. <clears throat> Composites, while they sound cool, and while you can decrease weight, and while they offer a lot of advantages, they may not always be the best choice. It depends on a lot of different factors, and you have to consider it. Say, if I'm gonna make one or two products, and I don't plan to use it for a long time, maybe composites make sense there if I really need the performance for those two products. But say I wanna use composites for a very long time and I don't really need the performance, then maybe composites is not the best choice because composites offer, uh, have a lot of issues during manufacturing and there's overhead associated with the, their use. They're expensive and they're expensive to maintain and they're expensive to inspect and they, they can come with issues. So you have to really balance whenever you need composites and whenever you want to use composites, you want to really investigate whether that's really something you want to do. There's also cost associated with that, their schedule. And, and so as a consequence, you want to look at the trades and determine, is that the right thing for me to do? Because it may not be the right thing to do. Every situation is different. And so you have to really determine 
through a cost trade uh, study, a scheduled trade study, and understanding the infrastructure that you may need to make these composites, because you're also going to need infrastructure. You're going to need an autoclave, potentially. You're going to have to need non-destructive evaluation procedures to look at the production that you had. You have to consider a lot of factors, and as a consequence, it's of extreme importance that you look at all these factors together. Analysis alone is not sufficient for the certification of composite systems. You have uncertainty in failure modes, complexities of failure modes. You have variability in manufacturing, workmanship issues, and process dependent issues. And as a consequence, and I bring up these three topics that may be disjointed to you right now, but these are the three challenges that we face with composites. We want to use them, but you have to get the best out of them. You can't just use them because you want to. The second thing is decision making. Should I use them or not? But I have to really evaluate the life of the program, the schedule, the cost, and do those trades to understand whether it's really advantageous for making profit, which could be the end goal for your organization. And then the third challenge is that you can analyze metals very easily. But when it comes to composites, it's not that easy. And you do require a lot of testing, a lot of understanding of how the material behaves, a lot of understanding of the failure modes, a lot of understanding of the workmanship issues that you could encounter. The understanding that each build is going to look different from the next build because there's variability when it comes to composites. Understanding that even a small change in the process on how to make composites can affect the strength. And I already showed you a video that shows all the steps that it takes to make them. Even if there's a vacuum leak or a small imprint or if the person did not use gloves and the grease was touching or if they're using gloves but they're contaminated or they're sealing paint that fell down onto the composite. All those things need to be looked at because it's going to affect the strength of the composite. Analysis alone is just not sufficient. And the fact of the matter is that these five components that I'm talking about have a direct impact on the cost and schedule. So you have to really balance, is composites really the right thing to do for this application? I don't want to just use composites because they sound cool. I want to use them because it's necessary for the application of interest. And that's what you want to really try to strive for, to do the right decision for the right application. And then we talked about uh, the fibers. For fibers, you can, you're going to have uh, several types. You could have a carbon fiber, uh, which starts as a polyacrylonitrile fiber. You have the boron, which is an advanced fiber system. A glass fiber, which is a first synthetic fiber, and it starts as, as a silica sand. And you have silicon carbide. So these are the typical composites you could have. They all provide different stiffnesses. As you can see here, here I show the stress strain curve. Carbon fiber has one of the highest stiffnesses. And that's why you're going to see carbon fiber be, being used quite extensively in aircraft and automotive industry. For metrics materials, you have polymers, metals, and ceramics. And when you combine fibers and metrics, you're getting the full system as a whole. So fibers, let's, just, let's start with glass. Uh, and I want to go through advantages and disadvantages and the types of glass you could have. Fiberglass is the most widely used fiber. The advantage of that is that it's low cost, it's corrosion resistance, but also offers low cost rel relative to other composites. The real disadvantage here is that it's low strength and it also provides too much uh, compliance, so high elongation. And it offers moderate strength and weight. As a consequence, you're going to see fiber glass composites being used in surfboards or sporting goods because I don't need the highest performance in the world. It needs to be light enough. It needs to be strong enough. And that balance makes it perfect for this kind of application. So we also got the types of fibers. Uh, we have E-glass and, and S-glass. S-glass tends to be higher strength. Fibers like aramid, we have Kevlar as, a, as an example of an aramid fiber. It's a high-performance uh, fiber system, 
And examples where you may see these Kevlar applications are more protective clothing, industrial, and even sporting goods, because in some applications where you have high impact events, you wanna have a Kevlar system because it's very good at high strength and it's also lighter than glass and it's more ductile uh, than carbon. So, so really good stuff uh, for, for, for that. And it's actually used in a lot of protective clothing again. The one you're gonna see a lot is gonna be fiber carbon. The fiber carbon is high stiffness and strength, low density. The properties are pretty nice. You know, they, they, they have a range of properties from standard modulus to high modular system. And you know what is amazing about carbon to me is still, is insane to me is that uh, it's five to eight microns uh, only in diameter. And that's smaller than the human hair. So when you board an aircraft, when you're boarding an aircraft or you're looking at a launch vehicle or a spacecraft, we're really talking about here uh, of a composite really made of high performance composite, okay? which has, you know, diameter carbon smaller than human hair. So what is providing that strength is really the idea that the strength is in numbers, like ants. Have you seen ants carry very heavy weight? Well, when you put these fibers together and you put 2,000 of them, 12,000 of them together, right? That's gonna provide the greatest uh, strength in a particular tow system. Uh, types of carbon fiber, it varies in strength with the processing and there's trade-offs of strength and, and modulus that need to be considered. Boron fibers are another type of system. They're high stiffness, very high cost, uh, large diameter, very different from this uh, carbon, which is five to eight microns. Here we have close to 40 times the diameter. Great compression strength as a consequence uh, we also have another one called polyethylene. Trade name is Spectra Fiber. You may see the high strength, extremely lightweight, low range of temperature use. So very nice for low range temperature use. We also have ceramic fibers, uh, like very high temperature applications like composites for engine applications. Uh, that's where you're going to see that. And here I like this plot because it shows the comparison of the different systems. And I want you to focus on, on a very popular one, which is the AS4, um, which is number four here. That's using a lot of research labs around the country. Uh, really high, a very, very nice strength, very nice stiffness. When you go to the IM7, which is a high class, you know, composite using aerospace application, very high strength. Look at that, way above everything else out there. A very nice stiffness. You go to boron, much higher stiffness. And then you go to graphite, way higher stiffness, but look at the strength keeps dropping. So, so there's trade-offs and you have to look at your application. You have to look at what you need for your application. Some cases you don't need the strength. What you need is a stiffness. And so you wanna balance that in the, during the life of the program. Here, what I show, and this is a great plot, is a table, it shows the tensile strength and tensile modulus across a range of fiber systems. And what you see here, for example, is I have e-glass, which has very low tensile modulus compared to everything else. You know, and then we look at e-glass, how that compares to carbon, for example, in terms of strength, and it's not that off there. It's, 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 it's less, but it's not that off. You also have the fiber density. You can see how the carbon has much lower density than the glass systems. Uh, now the, cerat the silicon carbide here, very, very high. Uh, density, so it's heavier by twice than carbon, for example, which makes sense. When you look at this list, it makes sense why we use a lot carbon systems in set T300, IM7, S4. We use those in aerospace applications because they provide great uh, low density, yet very high strength, which is great for the applications of concern. And the modulus is, are, are great as well. So that's what we get there. You can see here, if I were to compare now these fiber systems to steel or aluminum, I can see here that I have 7.87 for steel and the highest I see here is silicon carbide, 3.19 grams per cc. And so you can see it's double the weight 
And then the modulus I'm getting, you know, it's it's not much better, right? We're, we're seeing here the modulus is 43 for silicon carbide, 207 for uh, steel. And then you can see here the tensile strength 0.38. Look at that. Look at that beauty. Everything here above one GPA. GPA not not great point average, but uh, uh, gigapascals. So amazing stuff, uh, great performance across the board. So so going back, E is for electrical, S is for strength, and there are other types of glass. For example, you may have T glass, which is for thermal. R glass is going to be for reinforcement. You're going to see A glass for alkaline. Uh, and other applications as well. And, and the idea here, guys, is when you are when you're tailoring a particular system across the board, what you want to do is get the best performance and the best application. For example, if I really want a fiber system to get you the better conductivity, electrical conductivity, then e glass makes sense. And that's what you want to do. You want to balance cost. Okay, you don't want to go crazy just because composite sounds cool and I have a surfboard I want to make, I don't want to go with IM7. Who is going to buy a surfboard that costs like 20,000 grand? Maybe there'll be some that will do that, but you want to be smart about density. You want to look at the weight density. You want to look at the strength performance. And then all that needs to be combined into a package that also makes you profitable. Because the end goal here is profitability, okay? Maybe some of you may think that some of this is for the environment. But in my, in my experience, in my experience, environment plays less of a role. Now, I encourage you as a good citizen of this world that you try to also take that into consideration. But from my experience, a lot of the push is going to be performance, performance, profit, profit, profit. And, and, and if you wanna be a good citizen of the world, you want to consider environmental effects. Of course, I want to do that, but I guarantee you that a lot of these applications, you're going to have to charge people more money or they're going to really buy. The other thing I want to keep in mind, and I really encourage you, if you're going to pursue this area of expertise, to do some research as well. So if you want to pursue research in this arena, I encourage you to do that. One area that we need more research on is sustainability. We want to be able to come up with materials that are biodegradable, they're able to give you the performance you need, yet, yet when you're done with the aircraft, I'm done with the aircraft after 30 years, I'm done. I, wanna, I want that aircraft to be biodegradable. Can we do that? Can we find ways to do that? And so I challenge you as engineers, young engineers, and challenge you whoever is looking at this, to come up with ways of doing that. And absolutely, we want to do that. But keep in mind that a lot of the applications, short-term implications and applications are really to try to get the best performance you can with less cost for the most profit. That, that's really what drives a lot of this stuff. We want to be environmentally friendly, sure, but keep those things in mind as you're working through these ideas, okay? And again, I'm all for the environment. I'm not against the environment. I really want us to do the best we can, but we need, your, we need to figure that out, right, as a society. So we have a lamina with unidirectional fibers. And what I mean with the unidirectional fibers, the farmer, fibers are running one direction, as you can see here. Then we have lamina with woven fibers. So fibers going in one direction and also in the other direction. Now it sounds very strange, but the warp direction tends to be the straight fiber and the field direction tends to be the one that goes one up, one down, one up, one down. So something to really keep in mind as you're working through this is this can get confusing. So unidirectional fibers, fibers going along one direction, woven fibers, I have fibers going in two directions, as you can go up to three directions, I'll show you an example later. A composite lamina is more than two plies. If you see a sandwich structure, you're gonna have two kinds. You can have two kinds. You can have an aluminum core as one example, and you can have foam core as another example. Which one you select is going to be up to the application. For example, in aircraft applications, 
if I select an aluminum core for the tail, what's going to happen is that aluminum could get corroded. So maybe you want to do something, select a different aluminum that's more resistant to corrosion. The foam, for example, is a material that can absorb a lot of moisture and it can have strength reduction as a, as a consequence. Foam core may not be good at very cold temperatures, it can start cracking. It could be quite degraded at very hot temperatures. You wanna look at all these factors as you work through this because it's not straightforward to just say, I want one or the other. There's other kinds of core materials like Nomex uh, and many other kind of applications. Now, why composite sandwich structures versus a laminate? Let's think about that question very carefully. A sandwich structure, as an example, can take very nice bending loads, right? Because I put two faces apart far enough and in between I put core material. The face sheet is going to take the majority of the load while the core is providing the bending resistance. So you're gonna see a lot of applications in aircraft, say for example, you have a core um, used in the tail, but the faces are fairly thin. Now you'll be surprised just by putting the faces apart so much, I'm increasing the bending moment of inertia. If you recall back in mechanics of materials, you learn that the inertia, you know, I can put air in between two strong materials and I'm increasing the bending resistance. Obviously I'm not gonna put air because air, you know, I need something to bind stuff together. But even if I took, and I'm telling you foam, I'm talking about foam here. Foam can be used in aerospace applications. And if you, uh, give me a second because I have, an, uh, I have to, do. so now I'm gonna continue here explaining that you have to, you have to look at the application of foam core and aluminum to determine what's the better application uh, for the actual, uh, whether it's aerospace application or it's an automotive application. Does that make sense? I mean, for composite materials, uh, then I have also uh, the fact that I have unidirectional composites. I have textile composites. And I, I already talked about this one here. We have random short fibers. We can have uh, continuous fibers. We can have plain weave, which I just talked about. We can have triaxially weave fibers. We can have fibers going in three directions and they have the biplane weave, uh, which also have the several fibers going in various directions. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, the composites you can see the most in a lot of the applications are going to be continuous fibers, plain weave, uh, these kinds of fibers. And when I say a woven here, what I really mean is two systems of yarns interlaced at right angles to create a single layer. While for braided, we're talking about a series of intertwined spiral yarns, okay? So here you can see a plain weave composite. A plain weave has one up, one down, one up, one down, one up. And as I said before, these straight ones are called a warp while this tend to be the fill. It provides fabric integrity. It applies dimensional stability. Uh, while a two by two twill uh, also provides even more drippability. And that when I say two by two twill, what I'm talking about there now is I have one down, two over, one, two down, two over and so forth. I'm sorry, two up, two down. And that's what I mean with two by two twill. When I talk about satin fiber harness, great for drippability as well, smoother surface, improved translation of fiber properties. And what I'm talking about there when I say five satin harness is going to be four up, one down, four up, one down. And, and, and that's, that five can be confusing, but we're, we're really talking about four up, one down. So if I say eight harness setting, it's going to be seven up, one down and so forth. So keep that in mind. If I'm, I give you a piece of composites, you can tell if it's a, a plain weave versus a, a setting harness. You can see from the surface finish. Uh, is, this is gonna have a way smoother surface finish compared to a plain weave, for example, more rough there. Braided composites. So you have diamond braid, you have regular braid, you have Hercules braid, 
you have tracks lead braid. So you can have various braided types of composites being considered. Woven composites, here's two by one twill, two down, one up, two by two twill, two up, two down, two by two basket. That's basically on two, in two directions, this is what's happening. You have the crown foot satin, uh, one down, three up. A five harness settings, these are the ones I just covered just a minute ago. And you have more and more drippability uh, when you have these situations. These ones can provide lower strength, for example, because now you have more undulations. And so that can cross stress concentrations in the fiber. Okay, so we continue on. We look at composite material versus metals. We have specific strength versus specific modulus. And in this case, you can see here how, and I created this and it, I like it. It shows uh, the fiberglass over here compared to metals. You can see quickly how the specific modulus has dropped. So I'm not getting a lot of performance out of the modulus, specific modulus pound per pound um, compared to metals. Uh, in terms of strength, clearly is in the ballpark as metals. Uh, and then for, Composite materials, look at that. Greater performance overall compared to metals in terms of modulus and strength. And we covered this picture already once. The point I wanna make in this picture is very specific to one thing I wanna point out because I covered already this in a lot of different flavors. But the main point I wanna make is graph, if you select a composite structure and use a standard quasi-isotropic material, which is zero plus minus 40, 90 symmetric, so zero plus minus 40, 90 symmetric is your quasi-iso. I want you to look at a specific uh, uh, strength here, uh, not too shabby, right? Compared to steel and uh, aluminum. So uh, specific modulus, not that, you know, not, I will not call that amazingly better. Uh, look at the ultimate strength. Okay, ultimate strength, you know, in the same ballpark as aluminum, uh, young modulus, same ballpark. Yeah, it's w lighter, but I'm not seeing a huge increase in performance other than a little bit decreased weight. So yeah, quasi-iso can give you good, good advantage there, but keep that in mind that you can tether them to get even better performance. Maybe, and I'll teach you how to optimize and tether composites to get the best performance, but the best performance may not be your standard zero plus minus 40, 90 zero plus minus 45, 90 symmetric. That might not be the best option. For example, in a pressure vessel design, in a pressure vessel design, a zero plus minus 45, 90 may not make sense because I have a lot of hoop stress, which maybe hoop twice makes sense, 90 degrees alone. And then I have a significant axial load, which is basically half, half of the hoop. And so I wanna also consider that in, in the assessment. When I look at composite materials versus metals, the advantages is high strength, high stiffness, tailored design, fatigue life, dimension stability, corrosion resistance, low thermal expansion. Here can I see, I can see a fatigue curve and the fatigue curve compares the fatigue of composites versus aluminum. Clearly here you can see the increase in life for the same stress. Disadvantages, manufacturing variability and defects, complex mechanical characterization, complicated repair of composite structures, degradation of structural properties on the moisture and temperature, poor energy absorption and impact damage. So that's a disadvantage. Uh, you, you're gonna have much more harder time getting a full characterization test. It's gonna be harder to repair. That's very well known. It's gonna degrade much easier when subject to moisture and temperature. And under impact damage, it could have issues there. They can be expensive and very complex to inspect. And again, a lot of uh, manufacturing variability needs to be considered. When I look at failure modes of composites, we have fiber breakage. We can, and fiber breakage means the fibers are breaking apart. We have uh, delamination, which is ply separation. You can see here two ply separated matrix cracking, which is cracking of that matrix. Here you can see applied lifting and crushing. 
Okay, so the other thing I want to point out is that the fading modes in composite materials for laminated composites are quite complex. You could also have fiber to matrix debonding. The fiber can come apart from the matrix, that debond can come apart. You could have uh, crushing at the hole. So for example, the bolt here is pushing against the fibers, buckling them. I could call that micro buckling, for example, of those fibers. Um, you could have ply lifting where the fibers are getting lifted by the by that shaft pushing against the circular hole. So when we look at the fading modes of composite sandwich structures now, instead, what we have here is a number of fading modes. And we show them here on the right hand side. So let me start with phase sheet failure. Phase sheet failure is going to be any of these failure modes that occurred in the lamina, but is occurring here in the phase sheet because phase sheets will be made of lamina, for example, in a lot of applications. Then you have core shear failure where the core cracks, okay? That's one possibility. You also have phase sheet wrinkling and core crushing. So here you can see the phase sheet has uh, uh, wrinkled and crushed, okay? And then we have buckling and delamination. And then we have shear crimpling. We have shear crimpling, which in this case, there's eccentric loading that's causing the crimpling there. And then we have phase sheet dimpling. Uh, and then intercellular buckling. Okay, so intercellular buckling means, for example, take a honeycomb structure. A honeycomb structure is gonna have um, a phase sheet that's unsupported uh, between the empty cells. And so now the phase sheet could potentially buckle in between the cell walls. So that's what we're talking about there. And these ones here, these four here, really talk to instability phenomena due to compression loads. These are what these four are. Uh, and in general, uh, uh, the shear crimpling is an instability failure mode. This one right here, I wanna co cover a little bit more. So that one occurs largely when you have auto plane deformation. Let's say you have a buckling event, that's where this could happen, for example. And then there's other picture, other fader modes that did not cover here, uh, such as, for example, core identation. So if you have out of plane concentrated loads, um, so you have an attachment here, an attachment right there, um, the attachment can push a concentrated load into the fitting corner joints. And I'll show you that uh, in a case study later in an actual application. And they can be, that can be avoided by spreading the load over a larger area. So if I have an attachment, I wanna make sure I know what I'm doing with that attachment carefully, okay? We also have, um, I wanna cover also a little more the fish wrinkling that I talked about. So fish wrinkling, which you see here, is the potential for implant compression load to be so severe that it pushes the core down. It crushes the core and buckling then occurs as a consequence. So these are the fatal modes. Again, a lot more complicated for sandwich structures, a lot more to consider. And then you have the laminate failure modes. And these failure modes are going to be part of this set of failure modes. So not only you have these failure modes, you also have all these failure modes to take care of. Okay, and in this course, we're gonna cover how to predict these failure modes and how to assess them for a particular design. So then we talked about manufacturing already uh, quite a bit. We talked about, you know, you have pre-preg, you have the tooling, and then you put everything together uh, in a layup, you vacuum bag it, and then you cure it in an autoclave. Uh, you, and then you have your final product, which should be inspected and verified for no manufacturing defects. We also talked about the different components that go into making a composite from bottom to top. And in, in general, what we talked about is that 
uh, we need some release material. We need a tooling where we can stack the composite against. We need a dam that prevents epoxy from, or the resin from flowing out uh, uncontrollably. And then we have the breather materials to, to cause uh, the, the vacuum to disperse more uniformly. We talked about the bleeder material to absorb any excess resin and promote resin flow. We talked about making sure we have a peel ply that provides the laminate with the surface texture that we need. And finally, we talked about a vacuum bagging process that allows you to pull vacuum successfully using this double side tape with this uh, uh, pressure valve. Uh, and now you connect that to the autoclave and pull vacuum, put that in the thermal vacuum chamber. Um, and, sorry, in the thermal chamber, the, the autoclave, and then apply the pressure required to, to achieve what we want to achieve. And in the, the uh, vacuum here, what it's doing is, is helping us uh, uh, com compact the parts, so remove any voids, um, and the outer cliff then will provide the extra pressure needed to even push any other voids out. And we talked about how outer, outer cliff is basically uh, the part is getting cured outside of the oven and no pressure is applied. And then here's a zoomed in view of the things we discussed, so this is more of a summary. Uh, this is laying up a composite. You can see here foam structures getting um, uh, put on top of a face sheet. Uh, and on top of the face sheet, there's a film adhes adhesive. I don't know if you can see the, the white part. That's an adhesive. And you can see this, these dams uh, made of cork, which are meant to exactly do exactly what we talked about, which is to prevent resin from flowing out uncontrollably. Once you put the, the, the cork down, you put the face sheet next, the top face sheet down, and then you're going to have these areas that we have to apply a roller. You want to pressure, pressure it so it's like glued down nicely, and you do that with a roller, like if you're painting a wall. That's going to try, you're going to try to remove any voids you can in that process. And that's the picture I was showing here. This hand roller is helping with that process. So here as well, we take a roller and push any voids out the best we can, right? All we can do is hope the best. Be very careful in this whole process. And then we put this in the autoclave, running through the, a profile that has been predetermined by a lot of studies, either by provided by the supplier of the materials or you received them from the supplier and now you're verifying that the performance of the materials are up to par using the curing cycle. Once done, we cut it up. And once cut it up, we can inspect them first, or we can inspect them at this point in time. So curing, uh, the, what is the curing process? So I want to kind of, I, I talked about it before. I didn't cover stage A, stage B, stage G, stage C, stage D in carefulness. So I want to do that a little bit now. Um, but curing is drying and hardening of the resin matrix of a finished composite. This may be done on aided or applying heat, typically up to 100 PSI, with a temperature application of 250 to 390. Okay. Layup is the process of arranging those lamina into a laminate to make the desired part. We'll come back to that point a little bit later today. Stage A is basically when you receive the materials in the basic form, in the raw state. Matrix is in liquid form for thermal set resin or in granular form in thermoplastics. So very important to consider that. So the matrix is in liquid form for thermal resin or in granular form for thermoplastics. But stage A is the materials in the basic form. Stage B or B staging is when the fibers and resin have been combined together into a single layer and the thermal set matrix composite appears semi-liquid so the sheet can hold the shape. For thermoplastics, the matrix is solidified. In stage C, the layers in stage B are stacked to make flat plate laminates. In stage D, final product configuration is formed. We talked about filament winding. I won't cover this again. And we looked at uh, how filament winding works. We talked about fiber placements and how fiber placements work in a very nice way where the toes are fed into a heater. And then it already has a compaction ruler right there. 
Uh, and then as the fiber has been put down, you're rolling it and you're getting the, the highest uh, compaction possible. We talked about resin transfer molding, although I want to talk about it a little bit more today. Uh, in resin transfer molding, you have a preform. So you have a reinforced reinforcement assembly that forms a skeleton of the structure. And you put in your tooling. Uh, the mold then is designed to provide for resin injection and venting and is there to optimize the resin flow. So once you have that, you have the injection process to occur now and the resin metering, mixing and heating and injection occurs. Uh, from that point on, you go to now the curing process, which is going to be a prescribed time temperature cure cycle. And then finally you demold it. This is used a lot in automotive cars, high volume productions where you can see that of complex thick parts, dry fiber reinforcement, uh, is shaped into the place mold. The mold is then designed to allow for the injection of that resin. And during injection, the resin hardener are metered, mixed and heated and injected the pressure into a closed mold. And then after completion of the mold filling, the temperature cure cycle is completed. Um, you have the part done. And now all you have to do is demold it. Um, I won't uh, go into more detail other than saying resin transfer molding is great for high volume production. We also talked about compression molding a, a little bit as well, where the molding material is preheated. So now the molding material is the one preheated and placed in the heated mold cavity. The mold is then closed, the pressure is applied, and the material that in, that's into contact with the mold area is getting heated as a consequence. Heat and pressure are maintained until the molding material has cured, and, and basically you're going to have the product at the end. Uh, advanced composite thermoplastics can are usually the ones compression molded. Uh, and you can use all kinds of materials, uh, fiber architectures like unidirectionals, uh, woven composites, randomly, randomly oriented fibers. I've seen that used. I've seen chopped strand and randomly oriented fibers used for these applications. And so, We'll be talking about, first we'll be talking about resin composite processing. As we discussed earlier, composite materials comprise of fibers that are embedded in a matrix. So the fiber takes the majority of the strength while the matrix keeps all the fibers together. So the matrix will be of a similar consist consistency as glue, while the fiber will be, say carbon fiber is pretty strong fiber. And those fibers are embedded in this matrix, which I'm calling resin. Could be a resin, for example. And there are, in a one-step processing application, which is many commercial applications, the fiber and the matrix are usually processed directly into the finished product. And three examples of that, which I'll be going into more detail later, is filament winding and pultrusion and resin transfer molding. I'll discuss those later on as we move through this course. A two-step processing is a situation where the fibers are incorporated into the matrix. And when you do that, you're forming an intermediate product form. We call that B staging, and I'll discuss that later. And later is processed to form laminates, right? So we discuss how a laminate is comprised of lamina. And the lamina in this case is the intermediate product form. I put all the lamina together. I stack it up in at different ply angles. And then I'm able to then process it further through an autoclave, uh, which then allows me to get the finalized product. So two-step process first, fibers are incorporated in the matrix in the intermediate product. Then we're gonna go ahead, it's partially together, right? And then I'm going to put all the lamina together to form the laminate, uh, which is going to be made up of a bunch of lamina at different angles, ply angles. And when I say ply angles, what I'm really talking about is that the fiber orientation from lamina to lamina can be different. And I discussed some of that in a previous lecture, in the introductory lecture. We call that prepreg. So when you have fibers are impregnated in with matrix uh, to form the in, in intermediate product, we're calling that a prepreg because it's pre-impregnated tape within the resin, which is thin sheets of fibers basically. 
impregnated with a predetermined amount of uniformly distributed polymer matrix, typically the resin content can be 30 to 45% by weight in aerospace applications. A sheet molding compound is a situation where you have thin sheets of fiber pre-compounded with a thermal set resin, um, and that tends to be a lower tech application. So there, there are three primary processes, uh, process steps in the composite manufacturing. You have the fiber impregnated with the resin, which is basically a partial, partial cure. So it's not fully cured. When I say full cure, I'll discuss it more later, but it means that the composite has fully hardened. The resin has hardened completely and it has, it's going to retain its shape. You also have the fiber matrix assembly. Um, and in that step, you have you could have either uni tape or weave, and then you're going to do ply cutting, and then you will configure it into the right shape. The composite set uh, is set then into a final structural form, and that can be achieved by applying heat and pressure. And I'll, again, I'll discuss some of this in a lot more detail in, in a future lecture. Dif different manufacturing process can route. Uh, routes uh, can be used. And you have control of fiber and matrix contents, so you can control that. Um, so that means I can control the amount of resin content and depending upon the amount of resin content, the quality of the product is affected. And these different manufacturing processes routes can affect also the quality of the composite, like voids. Um, you could have voids within the composite. Voids may not be a good thing. If I have voids within a composite, within the resin, then those act like stress concentration. And those stress concentrations can then affect the performance of the composite. You have productivity, the process cycle time, and the cost. And the manufacturing processes that you could have uh, can, can vary. Uh, so for example, um, I'm listing a, a number of them from top to low. And here I am uh, describing the performance and the cost, okay? So that's some of the aspects we're discussing here. So we have uh, the pre-preg with autoclave pressure cure. So you're gonna have that pre-preg which is partially cured. The fiber and the resin are partially cured, meaning that it's semi-hardened. You can still mold it and the resin can flow once it's heated up. So you can put it into auto clip with pressure to cure it further. Then you have pre prick with vacuum bag only, meaning I'm not applying any pressure, just um, or, or thermal environments, and I'm only applying a vacuum bag. We call that auto autoclave. So I'm not using an autoclave pressure uh, vessel. Uh, but I'm now only doing it through a vacuum bag. I'm only pulling vacuum into the material I'm trying to um, basically process. Then we have filament winding. We have resin transfer molding. We have protrusion, compression molding, hand layup and spray, lay, spray up, and then reinforced resin injection molding. And then we also have the new technologies of the future, which we'll discuss on them. Like, additive manufacturing, uh, fiber, advanced fiber placement technology, which I will cover later as well. It's not a new technology anymore, but it's something to talk about. And so these are the various manufacturing processes where you can take composites uh, in, in, you can take the fibers and the resin and create a, a solidified structure that can work for your application. So very different from what you may have been used to with metals, which is a little bit simpler. So here you can see an example of a pre preg manufacturer. Uh, what you can see here is how the fiber and the matrix are combined into a single layer. We're only looking at a single layer that has been impregnated with resin of choice. So here you can see the carbon fiber spools uh, being then impregnated, right, into this resin film. And you can see that here. Um, and then as that's occurring, uh, you also have a waste release paper uh, over here. And then you're taking this material and then uh, spooling it in this manner. 
And that's your prepreg. And you can see this prepreg will be flexible enough. The resin again is prepreg and is B stage. What I mean with P, B stage is that it has gone through some polymerization. And that provides some tack uh, for the lip um, and it will be sticky. So I can then take layers of this, cut them up at different angles. So here I've cut up, we cut a, a, a layer out or a lamina out. I can cut more of this and stack them up and you'll have some stickiness. And the reason it's sticky is because you have a partial cure, it's not fully cured. So things can still flow when I heat them up. The material can then be, be pre-pregged uh, and you can uh, pre-preg as a unidirectional tape or a weave fabric. And then the pre-preg is then delivered to the manufacturer for cure. Uh, and it's going to have a specified resin content and fiber alignment. Uh, they, they, they can be temperature sensitive. So sometimes these pre-pregs are shipped in a uh, frozen or, or free, uh, frozen temperatures, cold temperatures, uh, to maintain the overall health of the resin primarily, okay? Okay, so draping, I wanna go back to the idea of draping. So when, when I talked about draping here, what I really mean is that it allows you to take a, 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 a sheet of lamina and you're able to lay it down into a tool. That tool can be any shape. And so when I say drape, it's kind of when you drape your curtains or your, you're basically setting things on a tool and it allows you to shape it into that tool. So that's what, what, I, what I mean with draping. And secondly, what I want to point out here is how the auto autoclave works. In essence, you're gonna have some amount of resin flow and the vacuum bag allows you to pull out all the potential voids between the lamina uh, so that the polymers can cross link between one layer to another. And so then the resin hardens and then you have a composite structure that has been formed. Again, a pre-preg lamina, so you're gonna have a single lamina here when I cut it out of here. Um, I'm going to get a laminate once I take these pieces and put them together, right? I stack them up on top of each other and you can see you have a ply angle, say zero degrees. I can cut it so I can get different ply angles. And I'll stack it up to get the highest performance I want for my application. And the idea there is to then cure it to get uh, a solid laminate. You have pre-preg processing, which is offline impreg impregnation. You have the resin film production, uh, which is done separately. And you have a release liner, typically a release film. And so here's an ex example of a 3M application or, or product. And you have this matrix material applying this through this coating unit. And now you take the fibers and impregnate them into the resin. And you can see there's a heating table uh, and these things are getting uh, basically wrapped up together. And then you have this cooling table section here that brings everything together even better uh, into that product that you see here. This, and you can see here that as it's been unrolled, it, it seems to be flexible. And the reason it's flexible is because it's partially cured. Uh, and it has the ability to be draped. Okay, so moving on here, we have pre-preg rules. You know, what are some good pre-preg rules? Uh, the user has to specify to the pre-preg supplier. So, if you're manufacturing a surfboard, it's up to you to then specify to the pre preg supplier what kind of resin you need, what fiber you need, what fiber sizing you need, and what surface treatment you need, toe size, and also the resin content. And the cost for this kind of pre preg can range anywhere between $800 to $3,000 per pound. So it's, it's, it's expensive. And Sometimes you will have a minimum purchase of 50 pounds. So, so now you're really looking at high cost uh, for the application. The pre-prick materials are very temperature sensitive. 
and it must be shipped and stored at low temperatures. We discussed that earlier at minus 40 C typically to prevent the material from reacting. The supplier will provide a cure schedule to the, for the material and then the supplier will also provide a recommended max out time at room, temp room temperature. What I mean with that is this, this roll of composite lamina is a prepreg and that's going to be stored at minus 40 C and shipped to you. Now, you have to do some work on it. You have to cut it, you have to put things together. To be able to do that, the manufacturer typically will say, okay, this material, if it's left outside, can stay out for so long. And so that's, that's what I mean with out time. And that's very important uh, for this application to make sure that we're not violating this max out time because if you violate the max out time, the resin may not perform as intended. Every time the supplier removes from the refrigeration, the prepreg will lose some of its life. That's the bottom line. So you take it two times out, it's going to be different from when you take it 10 times out. And if you take it 10 times out, you can expect a life reduction from the max out time period. A typical max out time can range anywhere between seven to 30 days. And how you come up with this, the suppliers do a tremendous amount of testing to determine those inputs. Okay, that's, that's the way it works. The PV prig has to be removed from the freezer upon which is then need, you need to defrost it. Of course, if I wanna be able to use this material, I cannot use it frozen. I have to let it thaw kind of like when you make a cake at home, like you buy a frozen cake and you need to heat it up, whatever, is the same process. You have to leave it outside until it comes back to room temperature. Typically three hours should be good enough. And the reason for that, for needing that particularly, to take that step, is that you don't wanna have uh, moisture from reacting with the pre prepreg resin. And why are you gonna have moisture? Is because you have condensation. And so if you take something that's really, really cold and you heat it up, it's gonna have condensation. So it's better for things to kind of defrost at room temperature and then you can take over. The reason for this is to prevent moisture from reacting with the pre resin. Like I said, this can lead to serious issues with both epoxies and cyanoester resins. Um, and it needs to be considered in your application to make sure you're not making an error in that arena. Moisture will increase the kinetics of polymerization for epoxies, and you're going to, you're going to also have higher viscosity, um, which will decrease consolidation and negatively impact predefined cure schedule. So again, you're going to have some issues that need to be considered. And you can see here the effects of moisture on the viscosity of the epoxy. On the y-axis, I have the viscosity. On the x-axis, I have time. And so definitely there is an effect uh, that's going to be um, due to the effects of moisture. Uh, and so that needs to be considered in your assessments. So here we have the pre prepreg layer procedure. We have the pre prepreg layer procedure here. We have a ply cutter here, the bagging and the inspection. All that needs to be part of your process. Uh, you have the raw materials, you have the pre prick fabric and the pre prick tape. And when I say pre prick tape, what I mean is that the fibers are oriented only one direction. So that could be unidirectionals. Pre prick fabric is that I have uh, fibers going in two directions, perpendicular to each other. Uh, then I have to cut, uh, I could use laser as a guide. I have to have tool preparation to make sure that I can then use it to create the, 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 the layup. So I can stack it up. I have to stack it up against something, right? We have to stack it up against a tool. Then I have the layup guide. And these are hard templates that provide guidance on how to put everything together. Then I'll lay it up on the tool. So I have aluminum, steel, inver, that could be your tool. And then I'll bring all the plies and stack them up to create the layup. When I say layup, I mean, I'm stacking up more than one lamina into a single laminate. Then I go through a deep bulk process and I have the bagging process. The bagging process means I'm going to take uh, uh, and, and protect 
uh, the lip in such a manner that can actually pull the vacuum. And so, and also, so things don't get stuck to each other. So you need the release film so you can release the composite. You have the fuel ply, the release fabric, the bleeder, the breather, and the vacuum bag. Then you go ahead and cure. You can do it out of autoclave or enclave. And then you'll remove the part and then you will do a non-destructive evaluation, which means I'm gonna do an inspection procedure to look for any flaws in my part. And then I go into MRB, which means I found an issue. Let's try to figure out what that is. It's a materials review board. There's an issue, sure, then rework. And then maybe fix it. And if everything's okay, go ahead. If nothing, if things are not working well, scrap it. If there's an issue, rework. And after that, I may not have any issues, so I don't have to go to MRB. I go straight to trim and drill, and I'll assemble everything very nicely. So I want to touch on this again because I may, I may not have been clear, but after you do a non-destructive evaluation, you may see an issue with a part that was that was supposed to be to print. Maybe there's a void or delaminations. That may trigger you to go to materials review board, which every company has, most companies have in aerospace applications. And that board may decide you have to rework or it's good to go, it's, it's just fine the way it is or you have to do additional work. And so that's after you rework or use as is, because you can just use it the way it is and it's just fine. Then you go in into assembly. So that's the gate there. And the second point I wanna make has to, with, has to do with debulking here in this step. And all we're talking about there is pulling vacuum to get all the trapped air out uh, as much as we can so that we can be successful. So here I have a thermal cure of pre-preg. Uh, somebody was asking, what is 45 versus minus 45? Well, you can see here clearly that if I have two plies of 45, that they'll be in the same direction. But clearly minus 45 means that it goes uh, in the opposite direction. So it's measured against a particular axis, the layup axis, and all the plies need to be relative to that. So when I say I have plus minus 45, the difference is that one set of plies will follow the 45 and the other set of plies will follow the minus 45. And those two could be different. You can see that they're clearly different in this plot. So these lamina, which are the pre-break lamina are then cut and then you stack them up against this tool and the pre-break is stacked and aligned depending upon the material properties that you want, which is why we're tearing these composites. And then I go through the process of going from solid liquid to gel solid. That's the process I wanna follow. And so you have some amount of softening and flow. The viscosity is fairly high. Then things become liquid and then you have chemical cross-linking. And here again, the viscosity will be changing. And here you're gonna have an approximate gel point of some kind. Here, I'll go into this more detail, but plies are vacuuming back at room temperature or slightly elevated temperature to remove any, any uh, open air that you may have inside. Uh, so, you know, for example, I have a cell phone and I bought a, a protective film that's glued onto my cell phone. And I kid you not, but it's full of bubbles. And I didn't do it, it was a representative at the store, but. Uh, you know, I should have done it because I could have removed these bubbles away uh, much efficiently. That's what that's the kind of thing we're talking about here. I'm gluing one material onto another. That's what we're doing with these plies. We're trying to uh, have the resin flow in such a manner that cross links are formed between these plies. The fibers will keep going in the direction they're going, but at least I can have some amount of uh, consolidation. So once you have this put together uh, in, a, in a vacuum bag environment, you can shove it into an auto clip, which you can see on the right-hand side. And the cure can altern alternatively be performed in an oven or with no pressure, or with no pressure and no oven. Um, but at least vacuum bag, because that's gonna um, remove the trapped air. Uh, specific pre must be used for these auto-auto clip processes. 
And typically, you will auto autoclave could result in higher void content and lower fiber volume fraction when that occurs. The tools that are used for composites, the molds used for composites are also known as tools. And that's what we're going to place the pre prick against. So if I'm making a surfboard that's curved, I want a tooling that's curved. Because when I lay down my pre prick, it needs to follow that contour so that when I put it in the autoclave under vacuum conditions, it can conform to that tooling. And you can see how vacuum back there could be very useful. It will push the lamina into, or laminate into the uh, tooling, which is very, very advantageous. Tooling costs and complexities increase as part of performance requirements and the number of parts. The tool can be flat or complex in curvature. The molds in which high performance composite materials are formed can be made from carbon fiber, monolithic graphite, metals, and you know, there's some benefits going with composites for some of this tooling is the reason is because the coefficient of thermal expansion is fairly low. While that may not be the case for um, other applications. A key issue with tooling for composites is the coefficient of thermal expansion mismatch. That's what I just discussed. And so going with high performance applications, you can minimize those issues. And so the more, the higher uh, when you're going through the heating cure, uh, the CT mismatch between the tool material and the composite has to be accounted for in the dimensional tolerance and also the quality that you get at the end because you may have some residual stresses at the end. After also of critical importance is how does the material interact with the resin being utilized. So if you use a material that could have a negative and adverse reaction with the composite, that could be an issue uh, also. Does the material, the tooling produce water? And so now the water affects the resin. So you have to keep in mind all these things as you're working it through. Here's an example of an Invar tool. Invar has a lower coefficient of thermal expansion, which makes it a good application to be using uh, for uh, draping composites. Uh, here, you can see there's a high performance part of uh, tooling. High performance tooling is expensive. Invar is a very expensive material. 36% nickel content, and there's various common grades of invar, but the point is that the thermal expansion is fairly low. And then, uh, yeah, you can look at other grades as well. And here you have large composites, curve tools right here. That's a single person, you can see how big it is. So here you have tooling for large structures. This is very challenging. Uh, tooling for large parts is a challenge given their size, thermal characteristics, and sheer weight. Uh, this master model for C-17 aircraft tail cone was produced using carbon foam covered with carbon bismuth mine. Prepeg, correct. So something can be mined, not very easy, uh, but required. However, composite molds are not always appropriate. The gems web structure needed large parts and they were initially processed on a composite mandrel. The composite resin was assigned an ester. Do you know what happened there? So what we don't take um, and, and think about through that. So mold release agents are used in bagging and what are release agents? So here you can see a release agent so, okay, let me explain what you're looking at. This is the tooling, the one at the very bottom. And then you have a seal. Then you have a vacuum bag. And here's all the different ingredients we need to make this composite happen. Here you can see the pre preg So all the layers have been stacked together to get the performance you need. You have a peel ply, release film, bleeder, and all these things will be discussed later. But I wanna talk about this release agent. This release agent is very important because it makes sure, it makes sure that the pre preg that you're curing does not glue onto the tooling. We don't want that. We don't want it to get it stuck into the mold. Typically some type of silicone is applied to the metal and baked in 
Teflon release film may also be used between the pre-preg and the mold. So that's typically the way it's done. And then you have to make sure that the surface preparation must be performed if you need to bond more. So if at the bottom of this pre-preg, if you plan to go through another cure cycle to glue it to other composites, or not cure cycle, but you want to glue it to a metal or something like that, you need to make sure that surface there has been prepared appropriately for that bonding process. And I will go through each of these steps in a lot more detail in a future lecture. We're still introducing the idea of composites and, and the different things that are occurring. And I wanted to start from micromechanics so you understand what we're covering here. We have the general vacuum bagging process and this is old school, so you have tool, you have the laminates, and then you have your release fabric, and then you have the breather material, which allows uniform application of pressure, and then you have, the, you have your vacuum bag and the vacuum pump. This vacuum bag is sealed down uh, on these uh, edges that have, you can see there's tape, usually double tape, double-sided tape, and then you pull the vacuum and ensure that the composite can hold the, that the vacuum back can hold the vacuum and that everything is well put together. The vacuum bagging process, you, you know, you have the breather, which is a loose polyester or glass fabric, and that allows the vacuum to, about, to be applied without collapse or sealing the bag. So that I'm pointing right now to the breather here. Okay, that one right here in gray. The bleeder, the bleeder, which is right here, right on top of there. So you have the breather, the release film, and then you have the bleeder. The bleeder is, there to, is a fabric that's put adjacent to the pre prig and that allows to draw resin, excess resin out and reduce resin content. So you don't wanna have a pre prig that has too much resin because that, that means that you have too much resin content you want a good balance. You don't want voids and you want the right amount of resin. So the bleeder just takes the excess. And then you have the peel ply. You can see the peel ply right there is usually a polymer fiber fabric that has been treated, that can be removed after cure and allows texturing of the composite surface, typically for bonding. And finally, you have the release film that I talked about earlier. It could be a Teflon, for example. So we don't want things to get stuck. The pre preg is laid out in the required orientation. And depending upon the thickness of the part, if you have a very thick part, you may require multiple debulks. And I talk about how debulks are basically um, trying to remove this void through a vacuum process or some application of pressure. Debulks are really intermittent vacuums hold, and I'm, I guess I'm defining here, either at room temperature or slightly elevated temperature, so the part can consolidate much easier. And, you know, of course, if you press two laminas together, if there is any voice, if I press it hard, then the voice could come out. And then the cross-linking becomes more natural and more, more, more complete. This is done as a function of plies laid down. The part is typically vacuumed back to 30 mini, MM HG and checked for leaks prior to being placed in the autoclave. So you have to make sure that everything, there's no, no leaks in, in your vacuum bagging procedure. The bag must not leak. Good vacuum bath must be provided. And you, what you really want to have, you want to have uniform curing. You don't want to be cured more here than in center. You want to have uniform curing across and the vacuum bagging process does assist in consolidation as well as removal of volatiles. So I hope that's clear to you, some of that vacuum bagging process. So with that said, so uh, there's ancillary vacuum bag materials that we should discuss. On the left side, I show the vacuum valve the bagging film, the breather fabric, the release film, the tapes, fuel ply, pre-prick fabric, 
release agent, vacuum sealant tape, you can see it in yellow there, and mold tool. So you have dams, and what is the purpose of dam? So the dams are going to be useful for limiting lateral flow of resin. So let me show you. You see this is pointed as dam here in pink. If I have this laminate, the resin could flow out on the edges, on the lateral sides. We can prevent that by using a dam. And a typical dam will be metal, could be metal, could be flexible polymer, cork or rubber. The release film allows to release the composite from the tool. We talked about it, otherwise it gets stuck. And these are the kinds of materials you could use. The peel ply provides surface texture and protects the parts during handling or machining. These tend to be Teflon coated fabrics. You have the release fabric and the release fabric allows resin flow into the bleeders released from tool. And that, became, that can be Teflon coated woven glass, Teflon coated fabrics. I already discussed bleeder. It absorbs excess resin and I showed it here. It's usually adjacent to the composite. And it usually is going to be woven fabrics, or woven glass or something. Breather will distribute vacuum over the large part area. And then you have vacuum bag, which envelopes the part and tool for vacuum. And that can be a nylon or uh, silicone rubbers. Even though the general process I'm showing is similar each time, there are a number of issues that arise every time a part either changes in complexity or size. So there is an art to this process. It's just like when you make a cake or you make food in the oven. There is many ingredients, but every time somebody makes it, it's gonna be different. And so that's why it's so important that the process be certified, that be consistent, okay? So the manufacturing processes uh, is as follows. We apply the release film on top of all the prepreg. The release film is perforated film that allows entrapped air to escape. So that's why we have that there. I'm, again, I'm kind of summarizing, saying it like three or four different ways, so it stuck six, I think it's important. We apply bleeder, which is, is a porous fabric on top of the release film and that lets you absorb the moisture in excess resin, cover that array. Apply a barrier film on top of the bleeder and the film is similar to a release film except that it does not, it's not perforated or porous. And then we apply a brittle layer and the brittle layer typically allows you to apply even pressure like I said before around the part and at the same time allowing air and volatiles to escape. Last week, in the previous lecture, I showed you a video of a composite manufacturing. A lot of these steps were shown there. So I hope that you've kind of really embraced composite manufacturing in a virtual environment. The final layer is back in bag and it is an expendable approach um, that is used uh, there, okay? So composite parts must be cured by a simultaneous combination of heat and pressure while under vacuum. Uh, so you, you definitely want to uh, apply heat and pressure on the vacuum. And the vacuum is applied to remove air and volatile products, while the heat provides the thermal energy necessary for the resin to flow and polymerize to achieve proper cure. Autoclave pressure of 3200 PSI is typically applied, so that, that oven right here is applying also pressure, to further consolidate the part. And what you're trying to do, you're trying to collapse the remaining small voids that have not migrated out of that part. So yeah, so something to consider there that, that I think we have to think about. The cure cycle has to be optimized. We wanna optimize it to get the maximum performance out of the mechanical properties that we can. And we wanna, Cures, the cure cycle has to be optimized to control the rheology, which means that how the resin flows. Um, and the heat reaction, uh, which also means multiple steps uh, need to be looked at carefully to reduce possible exotherms. So we can achieve the final cure state. And the pressure is typically in these ovens 
are applied with nitrogen gas, typically. And you can see here the part, so say I took this part here, this part and brought it into the autoclave. Uh, that's that part right there and it's, it's back and back. I'm applying pressure. I have a thermocouple and I'm pulling vacuum as well. And I'm checking everything to make sure nothing is leaking, nothing is, uh, um, that everything is working properly. The vacuum bag part is loaded in a high pressure autoclave for cure and that's, that's a benefit of the vacuum bag. It, it helps with everything we're trying to do. How are voids removed? I think I wanna describe this process because it's an interesting process that uh, occurs. In autoclave processing, the, under high pressure, what we're doing is reducing the void sizes by compression. And it dissolves the voids by increasing solubility of the gas, makes the voids more mobile due to increase in resin velocity. And the typical void levels from autoclave processes should be in the half percent to 1%. If it's more than 1%, there could be an issue with the processing, but you can see here how porosity percentage, and what I'm talking about porosity here, I'm talking about porosity is directly correlated to void content, how much void I have within the composite. And so the more voids I have, the more porosity I have, and I'll explain later how that's measured. But the bottom line is the more pressure I apply to the sample, the more benefits I have in terms of removing those voids and the porosity is dropping. Now, the point I wanna make is temperature has very little influence. You can see here, it has some influence, but not extensively. Uh, about here, you get about that pressure, you get about the same amount of porosity. But I also wanna notice how increasing pressure is not helping too much. So there's a point of, of um, the investment is not, very little return on investment in terms of increasing pressure. And increasing pressure can be bad in some applications. Say you have a sandwich core, uh, and we discussed a sandwich core last week, you have foam and then you have facies. If you apply too much pressure, you could crush the core. And I'll give an example later on about this. The autoclave processing, um, you know, I wanna kind of show you what's going on. Um, you have these voids that are gonna try to escape and, and we're hoping it could occur uh, through bubble compression. Uh, so the void is migrating, the void compression, void formation, and finally, boom, it goes out. And that's what we wanna see. Analyzing a composite material or structure can be quite complex. And so, but we have to analyze the composite structure ahead of any manufacturing, even for qualification, uh, because if I wanna qualify a structure, I wanna make sure I'm successful at qualifying a structure. So you definitely wanna still develop the analysis capabilities to ensure success during the qualification program of that structure. The qualification of the structure is important because it verifies the manufacturing processes. It basically certifies the personnel, the training, everything that went into making that composite, it helps you gain confidence that the processes were robust. The fabrication of the production unit after that one can be verified in many different ways. You have the process controls, making sure you have a FOD prevention plan, basically ensuring that you don't get contaminants within the composite as you make it, uh, making sure you keep the shop clean, um, keeping the procedures up to date, making sure your build paperwork is, is robust. Uh, all the things that will, make, that will come into making a composite is what you wanna make sure that those processes are robust. A non-destructive evaluation further can increase confidence in the manufacturing of the composite by revealing any flaws that could have been, um, that could form uh, during the manufacturing process, or uh, perhaps somebody left a back in paper, or there's a paint chip that came in there, uh, or there's contaminants like grease. Uh, the purpose of the non-destructive evaluation is to find those areas of concern. Um, and so the analysis, the way analysis can be helpful, or and it can be combined with testing, is that it can help you define the threshold of what kinds of flaws are acceptable. You can imagine that you, know, you may have flaws 
that could be one inch, two inches, but it, it will be very painful if we reject the whole hardware. May as well come up with acceptance criteria that you can use to apply to the hardware where you could either, either accept the flaw that you have, or if you need to reject, it can trigger repair. We'll be talking about repairs um, you know, in the future. Uh, there'll be a YouTube video where you can check out repairs. But what I wanna talk about here is what are we trying to achieve? We're trying to achieve a composite structure that is robust over the lifetime of the program. One of the things you wanna make sure is that the unit you produced um, is robust. And one way to do that is through an acceptance test. Um, an acceptance test can be through a proof test. The proof test, what it does, it could apply a load higher than the operational loads, and usually it's adjusted for the environmental correction factor. So say that in flight, you may see 200 degrees F. We know the strength of the composite is decreased at 200 F, but the testing you perform on the ground is at room temperature. You can correct the proof factor and increase it over the operational loads to be able to account for the test that can fly differences. And the purpose of this proof test is to show that there's no workmanship uh, issues that could be of great grave concern. Non-destructive inspection after the proof test even further increases confidence because if, if before the proof test, if there was a weak bond, that weak bond will be open up during the proof testing and perhaps um, you can capture it after the proof test and there's an issue, you can then correct it through a repair. And so, um, so these are the basic uh, good practices for the design, qualification, and workmanship verification of uh, a composite structure. However, keep in mind that different approaches exist in the aircraft industry, in the spacecraft industry, in the launch vehicle industry, and then in the sporting goods industry uh, or consumers, uh, consumer applications. So it's very important to understand that every program is going to have unique requirements, uh, but that in general, uh, ingredients such as this could be very beneficial, such as non-destructive evaluation, qualification testing, verifying that you have good workmanship, and then even performing a, 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 a proof test to check that your, your, your structure is robust for the one that you actually manufactured for use in service. Um, over the years, we have learned that composites um, can be structurally efficient, uh, but that we need to apply sound engineering judgment uh, and that we need to figure out guidelines that can help us, uh, you know, design robust composite structures. Uh, to that end, um, engineers over time have come up with lessons learned and best practices that are believed to minimize design and manufacturing risks with composite structures. And so what I wanna do is to talk about some of those um, lessons learned that I think could be useful. Uh, and we'll be talking about that in today's lecture. Um, but for example, I, I first wanna talk about the issues with composite structures. One of the things that you see is that uh, composite structures on like metals will have a low interlaminar tension strength in general a low interlaminar tension strength of about, say, 3,000 PSI to 8,000 PSI, you know, fairly low. And so if you have uh, load eccentricities and out-of-plane loads, uh, it could lead to some delaminations. This can also happen when you have many stacking sequences, uh, that stacking sequences that have too many plies at a given angle. And so that can cause residual stresses that can decrease the interlaminar, effective interlaminar strength capability. And so uh, we also know that uh, there are some nonlinear rate dependent responses for many polymer resins. Uh, laminates carry significant amount of the load uh, and the resin matrix dominated directions may creep. That's particularly a potential issue for elevated temperatures. 
uh, and it, you could then it start exhibiting, these composites could start exhibiting a nonlinear stress strain response as well. Uh, so the operational environments can induce creep, so it's important to keep that in mind as you're designing a composite uh, and, and not lose sight of these particular issues. Microcracking of a polymer matrix uh, is something that could happen. Resin matrix cracks may not always immediately structurally degrade the, the structural properties, but their propagation can lead to pressure cabin or fuel tank leads, as well as degre degradation in the durability and damage tolerance. So such cracks can allow the ingression of moisture and other fluids. And if you were to have, if you were to have cyclic freezing and thawing on these liquids occurring, crack propagation can be accelerated in these circumstances. So it's very important to consider that while microcracking can be beneficial in some cases, it can be detrimental in other situations. Um, the order of magnitude differences in the coefficient of thermal expansion can be quite problematic. One of the issues that you have is that if you have a composite um, that has a, if you're attaching the composites to metal, for example, the composites will have a lower coefficient of thermal expansion compared to the metal, for example. And if these two things are bonded together, the coefficient of thermal expansion can be such that the materials could deform at different rates, and as a consequence, it could cause a potential catastrophic failure of the bond line. Another consideration to keep in mind is that when, when you are uh, manufacturing composites, uh, depending upon the stacking sequence, uh, but you know you may find that since there's a mismatch, mismatch in the CTE in the parallel and transverse to the fiber directions, that you can now introduce unacceptable warping and thermal stresses, especially if you use non-symmetric layups, uh, and if you are using these kind of applications in spacecraft, which are supporting a mirror or something like that that's where this could be a potential concern. And so it is important to understand that the CTE can be a problematic point, point from various standpoints. Another thing I want to discuss right now is out of plane loads. Uh, these are examples of out of plane loads that you could have in application. And uh, for example, here you have a configuration uh, which is a flat wise, flat wise tension configuration where the stiffener is pulled away from the base structure. And a, a, an ex, explanation of that or an example of that would be a skin stif, stiffener separation due to normal pressure loading conditions. An application of that is going to be a wind skin or spar flat wise tension due to internal field pressure. That's an example where you could see that. A transverse tension situation is one where you're applying loading in the base and that since the stiffener is not taking much load, that it could cause edge stresses. A stiffener web splitting due to transverse tension loading is what you're seeing there. An example of that will be a wind skin spar transverse tension due to cord-wise loads. You could also have a situation of lateral bending where the skin stiffener separation due to lateral stiffener bending could occur. An example of that will be a lateral spar bending due to asymmetric field pressure. So these are just examples of where you could see it and this is a description of the load we're talking about. And in all these cases, the concern is that the autoplane loads can cause these delaminations between the composite layer, between, within the composite layer. Plus buckling is another situation you could have. It could be due to combination of compression loading. Even lateral loads can call, cause buckling. And so, Stiffener panel, stiffened panel subject to compression loading is an example where you could see this. 
Other situations where you could see auto plane loads are curved panel bending. So if you have a curved panel and you have bending on that, uh, you could have a situation where uh, auto plane loads could occur, which could lead to delaminations. A fuselage skins and frames subject to the bending loads is an example. Thickness which, which have transition regions where plies are dropping off. And what I mean with that is that a ply uh, will, will not continue compared to other plies. And that can be done to build up the composite to a thicker section. Uh, interlaminar stresses due to this eccentricity in the load path can cause delaminations right at the edges of this buildup. So ply drop-offs, build-ups, and doublers are situations where you may see this. Irregular loading is another example where you could have interlaminar stresses and, and stresses that could be detrimental that could cause delamination. And that could be um, situations where there's a presence of eccentricity. And that can happen if your design happens to have a joggle or a kink. Bonded joints, which, by the way, I do have a YouTube video on bonded joints, and I know I didn't cover it in this course, but you may see it in one of my YouTube videos, I go into bonded joints. I invite you to take a, a, a view of that. But uh, in general, interlaminar stresses would be quite high in these situations, and they'll arise from the eccentricity in the load, but also due to the mismatch in the different materials modulus. This kind of situation will be encountered in lap joint situations. So uh, continuing with the issues with composite structures, you know, there is this concern of reducing the strength due to impact induced damage. And the issue with composite structures is often th that this damage may not, you know, you may not see this damage because usually the surfaces tend to be dark and so and it may not be visible. Um, you can impact the, the, the surface, but then beneath you could have uh, extensive damage. Uh, it's possible. And so uh, this non-visible form of damage is a primary concern in all phases of certification of, of composite structures uh, for durability and damage tolerance in aircraft, launch vehicles, spacecraft. And so you got to you gotta use some sort of damage indicator and that can be paint, cork, or, or even protective devices to ensure that we don't introduce damage during the processing of the hardware, that you have insights into the hardware, that you're not missing something during uh, the processing that can expose the structure to various levels of impact damage that could, detriment, could be detriment to the strength of the structure when it's actually uh, put in service. Um, we also have a situation of the reduced thermal conductivity relative to metals. The reduced thermal conductivity can result in the presence of higher thermal gradients uh, and, and th than, than those that can occur in higher conductive metal structures. These gradients can cause unacceptable responses in the structure. Um, for example, lightning damage can be more detrimental to composite because it's a more local type phenomena that it will damage the composite since the heating was not able to, to get dissipated through the con conductivity of the material. So the heat transfer is not very effective in these materials. We also have the situation where uh, there is the environmental sensitivity of polymer resins. We know that there's a significant strength reduction of resin metrics influence properties such as compressions and shear strength and we covered some of that before that can arise when the composite structure is subject to elevated temperatures and moisture not only moisture can be absorbed and cause um, dimensional instability thermal can do that but not only that these two effects can also reduce the strength of the composite and it is usually a limiting factor for high performance applications, like in the aerospace industry. We also have the situation of galvanic incompatibility between the graphite fibers and some metals. And so to prevent corrosion damage, guidelines as, a as the ones required for titanium, titanium fasteners 
have been established. You want to put, a, you know, uh, perhaps uh, layers of glass instead of graphite composite need to be inter interposed between graphite plies and aluminum surfaces to prevent this galvanic incompatibility. This is mostly efficiently accomplished by con procuring the glass, glass composite ply as the outer ply of the laminate. So I want, I want you to pay attention because galvanic uh, issues, uh, galvanic corrosion can be a significant issue that if we don't pay attention to, it can be of significant concern. Reduce electrical conductivity relative to metals. You know, the less, the, the less electrical conductivity of composites can influence the response to lightning strike. I already talked about from a heat perspective. But at lightning strike attachment points to the exterior of the vehicle, damage may range from a superficial burn mark to some penetration to the skin. And so uh, I already talked about the overheating issues, but charge built up within the fasteners is not carried away by the low conductivity of the composite. And instead, you could have some... Uh, uh, you know, ignite some some vapors that could become uh, flammable, or it could ignite in a fuel tank. Composite structures provide less electromagnetic shielding of interior electrical components, and so these components can be seriously damaged by static discharge. One technique used to mitigate these effects of lightning strike is to use a metallic mesh, like a copper mesh. Uh, to increase the conductivity and then at least shield some of these issues. And, and so we don't have an issue without, you know, you may have some weight penalty, but at least you can uh, tackle the lightning concerns. So another thing I want to talk about is design guidelines that, that should be thought of. So, you know, one idea is to use symmetric laminates. Uh, it's, it's not always easy to use symmetric laminates depending upon the application that might, might not be the best choice. Um, but using symmetric laminates, and we talked about what symmetric laminates means, it just means that the plies in the stacking sequence mirror uh, the, the midpoint or the midplane of the composite. Um, and so you may not be able to always enforce symmetric laminates at tapered zones, unfortunately. However, any asymmetric existing due to manufacturing constraints should be minimized because that's going to cause some amount of interlaminar stresses at times, and it could uh, sometimes uh, um, cause additional warping, twisting effects. Uh, it could introduce bending and maybe even coupling between extensional loading and bending stiffness. So the stiffer the laminate and the greater the asymmetries, the more preload or shimming may be required to provide an adequate speed up uh, during manufacturing. This can result in significant stresses being induced in the part during assembly that may degrade the part's structural integrity. And so uh, the benefits of using symmetric laminate is that you're able to prevent warping under thermal conditions and also uncouple the bending and membrane responses. We talked about some of this before, just trying to bring that to light again. Another thing I want to point out is there is this tendency of wanting to extrapolate test data when it comes to composites, but sometimes the testing is going to show that the strength or the modulus may not correlate linearly with temperature or moisture, and so you want to be careful because there could be a cliff, and so it's important that you always determine all the relevant properties relative to the design of a composite and that you try not to um, be too quick at, at extrapolating test data. I think interpolating could be okay in many cases, uh, but it is important to uh, perform an adequate number of tests at the critical operating ranges. Uh, and so that, that, that is a major consideration that should be accounted for. You also want to keep a re reasonable number of primary load carrying plies away from the outer surfaces. One of the reasons that's beneficial to do is because these critical plies um, 
you know, are not easily damaged by minor impacts. The outer plies um, can then protect the inner plies, the ones that carry the most load, a little more carefully. So cl cloth flies, you're gonna see very often is used in the outer surfaces because it will resist the matrix cracking events and so you will have less splintering. Uh, the damage usually remains confined when you use cloth plies, plies so that's kind of nice and it's easy to repair. However, that doesn't mean you're gonna have, you know, it's possible you're gonna have subsurface damage. And so when you encounter that, it's important to perform some amount of non-destructive evaluation to find this um, you know, potential damages that are hidden from the impact events. But the outer surfaces keep the, 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 the plies are carrying the most of the load in the inside within the composite, and then the outer plies are more there to protect you. Now, one of the things I want to mention there is that you can use the idea of sacrificial plies. So say you have 20 plies that you need for composite, perhaps designed to 26, and then keep the extra weight uh, penalty mostly to protect yourself from potential for impact damage. So you have to kind of balance uh, what do you want to do if you want to keep it to 20 plies and you don't want to have you don't want to have any pocket margin. Then perhaps you have to you know up your game when it comes to uh, you know implementing the uh, impact damage protection plan. Basically, what are you going to do to keep the composite from getting damaged? What are you gonna to do to find damage when it happens? Maybe you're using paint indicators or something, um, some sensitive paint that will tell you, hey, you know, if something happened here, I better pay attention. And so um, laminates, uh, they're symmetric and balanced, increase the buckling strength. Uh, so the presence uh, of coupling between the bending and extension in a laminate generally increases deflections. That's the situation that when you don't use a symmetric and balanced laminates, they you're gonna get the B matrix that couples the bending and extension stiffnesses, and we know that could increase deflections. So we will make it, it those will make it more prone to buckling. And so um, at the same time, it's important to understand that this coupling uh, that could occur reduces buckling loads and vibration frequencies significantly. Uh, similarly, for laminates with twist curvature coupling, the deflections are increased, the buckling loads are decreased, and the vibration frequencies decrease as well. So, very important to understand that the buckling loads and vibr vibration frequencies get impacted when you don't use a symmetric laminate um, and it's not, when it's not balanced. Another thing that has been discussed extensively in the literature, and I invite you to pause the video and look for some research in this arena, but th there is some understanding that um, um, adding plus minus 45 degree plies uh, on the outer surfaces can uh, increase stability of critical laminates. And so it is something to consider. Experimental observations indicate that the value of M uh, which is the M that goes into the buckling equation. Uh, this is an integer, so M is an integer. If you recall, we, we talked about the Navier solution uh, using energy methods, uh, and we solved some buckling problems with, with the uh, Navier solution, and M was a parameter in the approximation, in the sign series, and so, M typically yields a minimum value of the critical load such that M over A approximately equals one over B. Hence the buckling load is a function of four times D66, which is a, a value within the D matrix, while only a function of one times D11 and D22. So these are like more going to the mathematical details. The point I wanna say here is that when you add this plus minus 45 degrees, it affects the D matrix in a good way. It increases D66, six, six, and, it, and it's four times more effective in raising the buckling load than adding zero 90 degree plies. So there are examples in the literature that go through that, and there's plenty of uh, plots that, that kind of demonstrate that. And here I have an example of gamma being plotted against these parameters and delta. 
and then gamma and delta are shown here, and the buckling coefficient generally increases when we can get those plus minus 45 degree plies in the outer surfaces. That will increase the stability of the structures uh, fairly well. Um, using uh, another thing I have not pointed out here is that using a larger fraction of plus minus plies in the shear dominated regions is a good idea because shear loads are best handled with plus minor, you know, plus minor minus applies in a structure. We talked about that plus minus 45 degrees. When we worked on optimization, I showed you how the plus minus 45 degrees will come up anytime we, we needed some shear being applied. Significant CTE mismatches are, are among the bonded or core cured structures must be avoided. You know, as we said, laminate CTEs, coefficient of thermal expansions are a strong function of the layup due to the differences in CTE in the fiber direction versus the transverse direction. Significant residual stresses can build up during the cool down phase from the cure temperature down to room temperature. And then you could have the situations where excessive values of CTE can be avoided. And you can do that by using fiber dominated uh, laminates. So you can control the CTE behavior and you can also even tailor it to get it closer to the metal if that's what you're bonding into. Uh, that way, if you're bonding metal to composite, uh, you know, reducing the CT mismatch can, can, can be useful for the bonded joint design. It's also very important to understand that resin matrix toughness um, is, it, it can be sufficient to prevent intralaminar cracks during cool down. So, Getting a good resin metric system can go a long ways in your design. I also want to talk about um, uh, a plus minus 45 ply that in contact with each other is a good idea. It, it minimizes the interlaminar shear value. It's not what I'm covering here, but just throwing another uh, you know, good design practice. Uh, operating temperatures of the laminate should be at least 50 degrees Fahrenheit before below the wet glass transition temperature. That is a good idea. At elevated temperatures in the presence of moisture, the compression and shear properties of the resin matrix can degrade seriously. So this degradation is, is due to the plasticizing effects of the resin matrix when it is exposed to hot, wet environments that reduce its ability to support the fibers and increase the likelihood of fiber microbuckling. So metric softening can occur due to the effect of moisture on the glass transition temperature. It's very important to understand that uh, with increased moisture, your TG is dropping. But in, in addition to that, the, the strength can also be impacted by, uh, by the effects of moisture and, and heat. And so, again, it's, it's very important to, to try to keep your, the operating te temperature of the composite with some margin against the wet gla glass transition temperature. Another thing I want to point out uh, before I run into this particular one is it's important to minimize stress concentrations. Uh, composites are essentially elastic to failure, so keeping some amount of uh, stress concentrations away can, can be very good for you. Um, and so um, I also recommend that when you're using 0 90 plus minus 45 degree laminates with, uh, uh, you know, you should have a minimum of, minimum of one layer in each direction. Uh, I think it's good to have zero 90 and plus minus 45 at the very least. Zero layers uh, for longitudinal loads, natty layers for transverse load. Plus minus 45 will take your shear and it will make it quasi isotropic. Now, quasi isotropic may not be your best solution because it's not optimized. And so I really encourage you to use the optimizer code to determine what is best. But starting with these ply angles is not a bad idea. It, starts, it, it gives you some starting point of what needs to be done. You don't need an equal number 
of plies at 0 90, but having one of at least each can provide some stability to your composite structure. Uh, maintaining a homogeneous stack and sequence by having several plies of the same orientation together can increase, uh, can result in increased strength. Also, minimizing the fiber orientation angle between adjacent plies is a good idea because it will reduce the free edge effects. I'll be talking about that in a minute. Uh, and it will avoid the idea of microcracking, particularly when you're looking at cryogenic applications or where you have wide temperature excursions where uh, the, the, the effects of interlaminar stresses can, can come into play. So minimizing the fiber orientation angle between adjacent plies is a great Great idea. So let's now dive into a new set of uh, design guidelines. We have the, you know, uh, one idea is to limit the interlaminar stresses due to CT and Poisson's effect. Uh, in essence, uh, minimizing the fiber orientation angle between adjacent plies is what I just discussed. Uh, when tapering composites, you want to drop off the plies in a way that's not detrimental, and that means maintaining about up to 10 times, 10 to 15 times the thickness of the ply when dropping the ply. What I mean there is, uh, pretend you have a ply here. Uh, if I want to drop this ply, uh, the thickness is T, so just drop it and then uh, let it drop over a length of at least 10 to 15 times the thickness. Um, and so limit the thickness of the laminate and number of contigu contiguous plies of the same orientation. And so that, that's very important to consider. Uh, it will decrease interlaminar stresses greatly uh, and uh, you'll be in better shape. Here's an example of how laminates uh, can, can impact depending upon the stacking sequence you select. So here's an example of the exact, basically exact some number of plies. You can see here, I have four ply symmetric in all these cases. And one of the things you can see here is that uh, the one that gives me the least interlaminar, so this plot here is the interlaminar stresses through the thickness. And what you see here is the interlaminar stresses are the highest for stacking sequence two and three. Okay, and that's two here and three here. and so those are resulting in huge stresses. But number five results in a much better situation. So again, uh, you wanna make sure that your design can, can reduce the amount of interlaminar stresses. If you can do that, you prevent uh, potential for delaminations. So two and three have plus minus 45 degrees, and uh, the, while plus minus 45 degrees can uh, help you with a situation on the shear loads, depending upon how you stack it, it can lead you to vastly different results on the interlaminar stress predictions. So it's important to play around with your stacking sequence. Uh, one thing you can do is perform a, a highly, superly defined finite element analysis, um, you know, not classical plate theory, but something more advanced than that. And, and look at the mesh and make sure you have good fine mesh density to study which stacking sequence may be the best for you. So, so again, very important consideration uh, for composites. It's also very important to limit the stresses. Uh, um, you wanna reduce the stresses uh, between uh, two materials uh, because that can cause a significant, significant concerns so limit the Poisson ratio mismatch between a stiffener and panel. Um, that's exactly what you want to do. A design feature uh, where that could happen, where the Poisson ratio can get involved, is a stiffener bonded, a stiffener bonded to a core cured uh, or core cured to a laminate. Um, and so it's important that uh, there might be good reasons for designing the stiffener with a fairly high percentage of zero degrees along the x-axis, uh, along this axis, the x-axis is this one, and that's to be able to, to reduce a Poisson ratio mismatch. Um, there might be also good reasons for designing, designing the skin laminates to be relatively rich in the plus minus 45, 
And so that way the Poisson contraction of the skin is resisted by the stiffener. And so then um, if, if you can re reduce that mismatch, that will uh, suppress severe stresses between the skin and the stiffener. So basically bring the Poisson effects close to each other. One way you can test whether your structure has Poisson ratios that are similar is for example, if I have the stiffener here and I apply a tension load, measure how much it contracts. Then take your laminate at the bottom and here you can see that you wanna apply a load and then see how much Poisson ratio you get in the other direction. And then just make sure the Poisson ratios on both ends are similar and you can use the optimizer code again to try to get those two together. I think it's important to characterize the effects of damage in a composite structure. And so uh, it is a good idea to test uh, at various damage diameters or porosity levels and understand what the damage versus undamaged pristine samples look like because uh, this information could be useful in your designs. A quarter inch allowable, design allowable, sometimes can actually envelop some of the impact damage events, um, but not always. Uh, they, uh, uh, you know, for example, a quarter inch hole can envelop some amount of damage in this region, but as the damage becomes larger, perhaps you, like this one here, this curve keeps dropping below the quarter inch all design allowable. So it's important when you design a structure that you account for the types of damage you can have in the future, and then perhaps a quarter inch allowable may not cover you for everything. Perhaps you want to design to a to a higher hole um, size that could cover even this type of impact damage events. So in essence, characterizing your structure to various levels of damage can be extremely helpful in the design of composite structures. And the open hole um, analysis or testing can help uh, envelope some of the types of damage you may have by characterizing the full spectrum of damages compared to open hole can help you use the open hole itself to achieve a robust design. Other types of uh, design guidelines, uh, initial design, laminates uh, should account for the presence of fastener holes. It could go from a quarter inch to more. The final design of the composite should provide adequate support for post-impact strength. I've talked about that. So if you have an impact damage event, you should have good residual strength capability to continue to operate. And if not, you want to repair the structure. Good, having good repair procedures, having good repairs, that bring the structure back to the qualified capability of the structure is instrumental and paramount to ensuring that you have a successful structure. Continuing on here, um, reinforcing plies around the cutout should be interspersed with basic laminate plies. So if you have a region where you have a window or a cut, uh, so you wanna put a, a reinforcing plies around the cutout to reduce the stress concentrations from the cutout itself, but then the reinforcement supply should be interspersed with the basic laminate. And that's basically increasing the strength capability altogether. Minimizing the peel stress in thicker uh, stresses, uh, minimizing the peel, I'm sorry, minimizing the peel stresses in thicker regions um, by tapering the ends is a good idea. Uh, composites, uh, laminates cannot carry significant peel stress, which usually arise due to the moment generated near the end of a bonded joint. And so it's important to then um, consider tapering the ends. Uh, and so that's used as a design solution uh, and to ensure, you know, sometimes they use peels, uh, like basically fasteners to keep the ends, um, you know, together. Uh, and so that's one approach, uh, but in general, you want to minimize the peel stress in thicker joints by tapering the ends uh, towards the free edge, as an example. Balance the membrane stiffness of the adherence. So make sure the membrane stiffness of the adherence is the same on both sides of the joints. And the idea there is to reduce the unbalance uh, so that you can increase the strength as a consequence. 
Be aware of bonding laminates with significant amount of different CTEs, especially when using high temperature cure adhesives. So that's a similar derivative of the CTE things that we already talked about. But residual strains present in the joint, uh, residual strain, strains present in the joint are proportional to the differences in CTE of the adherence and the cure temperature. So uh, it is important to ensure that you can decrease the residual stresses um, uh, so that you don't, you know, you want to decrease the residual stresses by reducing the mismatch in CTE. We kind of cover that in a different context, but it's, it's the same idea. We also want to use a step lap or scarf joints in highly loaded joints. So pop, feel free to pause the video, search these terms and see if you can find them in the literature. Uh, but the bottom line is that this type of joints uh, can also minimize um, peel stresses. Uh, and so th there are good design practice. Other design practices is to use the most ductile adhesive that can satisfy the environmental requirements. Uh, a good design has an adhesive that is ductile. Uh, brittle adhesives will lead usually to low joint strength and greater sensitivity to minor design details. Ensure that adhesive and laminate curing cycles are compatible. If they're not, you can get in a situation where the adhesive cure cycle uh, will be severely degrade, degraded and you could have a failure. For example, should the adhesive require a cure temperature near the TG of the composite, that adhesive will likely be unacceptable. So it's important to make sure that the materials you're using are compatible for your application. Correct surface preparation of the adherence is essential. Uh, light abrasion of bonded surfaces is necessary. Uh, I have a whole lecture on bonded joints in YouTube that I invite you to take a look and I'll put it in the description of this video at the bottom. Uh, but I think it'll be a good uh, three hour or so adhesive tutorial about this stuff. These are applied drop-offs that I was talking about. You know, having these applied drop-offs can be very beneficial, um, but you also want to make sure that the drop-off length, so this length here, be about 10 times to 15 times the thickness. This is not a very good ply uh, stacking sequence in terms of ply drop-off because um, it's fairly thick. At the length and the thickness are in the same order. You want to kind of decrease that because otherwise you're going to have this peel effect that's going to pull the composite apart. Uh, there's a good design practice where you can apply outer plies to top on top of you know inner plies, and that can keep everything together successfully. So I recommend you look at that um, and and pay attention to that in your designs. You know, more 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 things are intangible that that could get missed. You know, designers should communicate with manufacturing team. Is the design even doable? Some designs may be challenging to implement in a real life, especially if you're going to be using an optimization code like Hypersizer or using the codes I discussed in Excel, using Excel. I don't care what design you come up with, it's important to sit down with experienced engineers and ask them their opinion about your design. Does, does the design make sense? You know, is it analyzable? Can I simplify my design so we can analyze it in an easier way? Is the design even testable? Those are the questions you want to ask yourself before you start manufacturing your parts and releasing drawings. Please understand the prom requirements. We want to make sure that you understand what temperatures, what moisture levels, what factors of safety, what basis allowable you should be using. We discussed A basis and B basis allowable, but every prom is going to have very unique considerations. And so you want to make sure that you understand those parameters before you put your design forth. Uh, well, you can put your design forth, but then you have to make sure that it's, you're flexible at modifying those designs to meet the program requirements. It's also important to make sure that the structure is manufacturable. And so we also want to make sure the size, the weight, all that stuff is accounted for, that the materials com are compatible with whatever is going to be touching. We don't, we don't want galvanic corrosion, for example, so keeping all that in mind uh, is very important. Material selection, 
uh, requires you to do a lot of work as well. Uh, before you just select the material, just make sure that the vendors have enough uh, availability. Um, make sure that you've done exhaustive research of all the material available from the vendors and select the best one for you. Uh, just because you use composites doesn't mean that everything will be simple. In fact, more likely than not, things will get complicated due to manufacturing errors and many things like that. You, the vendor could run out of material. You may have to replace the material and then you're going to have to recall the material. Uh, which we, we discuss extensively, um, but it's going to take a lot of work. And so you want to be, be prepared uh, to be able to be robust over the life of the program that, in fact, you do have enough material over the long run to, to really run it smoothly. Now, this is not always the case. Sometimes you just encounter a situation where the vendor may, may even go out of business. So... You cannot control everything, but you can control um, in ensuring that when you're selecting the materials, they're the best for your application, that they're available, that there's an understanding of of what are the propensity of these materials in terms of interlaminar failures and things like that. And I did discuss the Agate database. You know, you guys looked at that, the InCamp database. There's a whole slew of materials available from the National Aviation Institute, Institute Research that you can also look at that's going to help you in making some of these selections. And uh, even if you make the selections of these materials, you want to do some testing in-house to kind of validate your processing to make sure the material strengths and modulus and all of that are in line to, to, to your manufacturing processes. Another thing I want to point out is that it's very important to keep some pocket margin, some, some additional margin uh, in your pocket. That's why it's called pocket margin for non-conformances. You're going to have manufacturing issues, handling issues. So typically keep some margin 15%. Some people even keep 50%. Uh, I'm not saying go be that extreme, but again, 15% margin, additional margin can be an impact to the weight, to the weight so severity penalizes that, uh, but it can also help you uh, with handling manufacturing issues. So you have to basically balance um, if you really want this much pocket margin or you, know, you have a good uh, sense of how you're gonna you know, incorporate uh, repairs if you were to have non-conformance. So everything here is a balance, right? I'm not gonna tell you what to do. All I'm gonna tell you is you have to balance um, the robustness of the design making sure that you have good repair techniques if you need them, and that perhaps your pocket margins are so sufficient that you don't have to worry about any of that. And so you're good to go. You can use as is. Uh, you can use the part as is. I apologize for that. Uh, there is a, a paper uh, that you can find. It's called a summary and review of comp composite laminate design guidelines. Task 22, NASA contract, NAS1, 19, 347, published in 1997. There's an even better design practices and guidelines available. Um, but here's another point of view from a different uh, set of eyes. You know, really quickly, almost serves like a summary, but employee balance and symmetric laminates. Why? It decreases the B matrix, avoids bending, coupling, warping, twisting effects. Avoid stacking, stacking too many plies at all one angle. Why? Because of the delamination and residual stresses are more likely uh, if not avoided. Add fabric plies to the inner and outer layer. Why? Because it can help you with impact damage. Add plus minus 45 with at least one pair of laminated extremes. Why? Because it increases the buckling for thin laminates and also provides you damage tolerance. Use large fraction of plus minus plies in shear regions. We already know that from our optimization course, uh, the optimization lecture, and we talked about how shear uh, is a, uh, can be taken very well by these plus minus plies. Plus minus 30, plus minus 45, that's what I'm talking about. 0, 90, plus minus 45, we also talked about that. Having one layer of each can be beneficial uh, because it will let you take multi-axial loading conditions and then also provide you an overall stability for the laminate. Now, don't just use your plus minus 4590 as the only plies because then you get a quasi-static 
stacking sequence. And the whole point of using composites is to get creative and be able to exploit uh, how much strength you can get out of them. And so quasi-isotropic is basically black aluminum. You're getting the same properties in every direction. So you may not get the weight savings you're hoping for. A plus minus 45 ply that are in contact with each other can minimize interlaminar stress. And maintaining a homogeneous stacking sequence by banding several plies of the same orientation together can increase strength. And then minimizing the fiber orientation angle between adjacent plies will reduce the free edge effects. And then you can also avoid the micro cracking issues, particularly for high thermal applications. Joint design practices in general. So these are basically looking at joints. Uh, I did not discuss this earlier, but I want to bring that to light. For a zero plus minus 45 90 degree laminate joint, uh, using a minimum 40 percent plies at plus minus 45 and a minimum 10 percent plies at 90 degrees is a good idea. It provides overall good strength of the joint by providing good shear out strength, bearing strength, and net tensile strength capabilities. I'm not saying use these numbers, but it's generally a good idea. Maintain a fastener edge distance to hole of two and a half to three. So take a hole, the edge distance to hole diameter uh, should be this much, improve the bearing and shear out strength capability. Maintaining a fastener hole spacing to hole diameter of 6.0 is a good idea to minimize the interaction effects between holes. Recall that each hole can cause a stress concentration. If it's too close to another hole, then these two holes will have a stress concentration of their own. And these stress concentrations, their respective stress concentrations will then overlap potentially and then cause a serious issue. Design joints to, uh, you know, try to join in, uh, design them to be bearing critical um, because they tend to be non-catastrophic. So use fasteners of sufficient diameter, sufficient strength, and locally reinforced as necessary to try to induce a bearing failure and not have a catastrophic failure. Apply all best practices in bonded joints when it comes to surface preparation. Please look at the YouTube video on the bonded joints to learn more about this. But uh, there are techniques to uh, control the bond thickness, for example. For bonded joints, no 90 degree plies in contact with the metal surfaces is a good idea to reduce uh, the potential for uh, the reduction in lap shear strength. Bonded joints of plus minus 45 plies at last, at the very last step, uh, in the buildup uh, is a good idea. Uh, it reduces the load peaking by decreasing the ply stiffness locally. Uh, when adding plies, use a 0.3 inch overlap in major load direction when using a wedge type pattern. And so this, this is a good idea because it, it, it basically increases the strength. Use mechanical joints for direct tensions. Uh, bonded joints do not really develop an adequate strength in that mode, so it's important to really use mechanical joints for those conditions. If you can, uh, short bonded joints are more efficient than long ones. Uh, many people think that having a long overlap is going to be helpful, but the bottom line is that peak shear stresses will occur at the end of the joints, and that increasing the overlap not necessarily increases the strength dramatically. So there is a bonded joint uh, YouTube video, again, that you can check out that goes into this. Joint eccentricity produces large peel stresses, so we should avoid them as much as possible. And so there are ways to, to deal with that. 